Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Here we are again on the course in bioethics in the graduate program of cell and molecular biology at St. Thomas University. Beginning always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your divine love. Amen. Minimize the tile. Okay, as always, questions, comments from anything previous? Or anything forward? No? Past or future? Well, we only really have the present. I'm just looking at my calendar here forward. Yeah, this is number 10 of 16, so we're almost two thirds of the way through all of a sudden. <laughs> huh? Huh? It is, it is moving right along. All right, so today we have another controversial topic always within the text of um, end of life issues, nutrition and hydration. Nutrition and hydration. Okay. So, it doesn't sound controversial, but you'll see how it gets because the challenge is when the patient can't swallow, <laughs> right? That's the challenge. And it may not be of any particular illness, just old age, dementia, Alzheimer's, Get how to swallow. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be a main topic, and um, in the second half of the lecture, I have a case study precisely of uh, Terry Scheibel. Just to review a little bit, uh, healthcare is uh, providing cure for us, right? But at some point, there is no more cure because medicine has its limits. And even the human body and anybody has its own limits too. Every species has an average lifespan, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> including the human, which is around 80, right? I think it was what, 81, 82 for women and 76 or 77 for men, more or less. It also depends on the country because then you get into health habits and um, access to healthcare, et cetera. But the average lifespan for the human body as a whole seems to be about eight decades, okay? So what happens when there's mo no more cure? Well, there should be care. And care in principle is ordinary means of life support. Care is considered ordinary means of life support. Mm. What is care? Uh, I think I had mentioned this uh, already a little bit, but basic care, or at least these four items, uh, nutrition, hydration, shelter, and human interaction. So we think kind of the minimum for staying alive uh, and for humans, right? Uh, we need to eat, we need to drink, and we need to be covered from the elements. And also we need to socialize uh, one way or another because we are very sociable, we're a sociable species and so forth, it's part. So the last point is a little bit more on the psychological, the other three more on the physiological, but again, considering the whole person by right, the holistic view of the human person, these are at least the four basic uh, needs for care. And like I say, care in principle is ordinary means of life support, ordinary means of life support, okay. So they, ob they obligate ethically, bioethically. What happens then when a person uh, can swallow for a number of reasons? So I'm gonna concentrate mostly on the first two, which uh, are the challenge in end of life issues or a person doesn't have to be necessarily at the end of life, but uh, could have a chronic condition. Because uh, swallowing is, um, it's a combination, it's both kind of innate, but it's also a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. And 
nutrition and hydration are not necessarily the same either. Just to draw a little bit on this. Uh, you know that, I don't know if you've seen those mm, little bars, like a horizontal ladder on um, playgrounds, right? Where you go up one side and then you can... Monkey, monkey bar? Thank you, monkey bar. <laughs> exactly, I love the monkey bars. I like to be climbing on something. So you can do the experiment, but just be very, very careful. Mm, take a sandwich in one hand and uh, something and uh, a bottle of uh, juice or something on the other hand, get up there on the monkey bar and hang upside down, all right? And um, you can swallow the sandwich upside down. In other words, you can push that sandwich up against gravity <laughs> into the stomach <laughs> by the peristaltic movements. Yes, it's solid, it's solid. Mushy is solid, but it's solid. There is a peristalsis, you know, peristalsis is a um, movement of a smooth muscle. And it's somewhat similar to pushing a marble down a rubber hose. If you keep squeezing behind the marble, <laughs> okay? That annular type of uh, motion is called peristalsis. It happens a lot in uh, smooth muscles all over, including the fallopian tubes pushing down the little embryo <laughs> into the uterus. And uh, food, the stomach pushing uh, the intestines, pushing the bolus, the food down uh, the intestines and so forth. Mm, and the esophagus also. So the esophagus will push the mouth down like that, uh, the food. But liquids is different. <laughs> can swallow liquid upside down because it runs out and uh, we can actually choke trying to swallow liquids up, upside down. It goes into the, uh, the wrong tube, it could go down the trachea, which leads to the lungs. All right, exactly. So physiologically, it's all different to offer nutrition and to offer hydration. Mm, but basically the two are taken together are uh, also um, a learned behavior. And what happens with uh, the elderly sometimes, like I say, senile dementia or Alzheimer's, they forget how to swallow. <laughs> and sometimes you give them food and they'll be chewing and chewing and moving the, the food back and forth in their mouth and they don't swallow it. <laughs> hmm? So it's difficult. Or uh, if they swallow, they start choking because they don't, the, the reflex are, are, are being lost in the glottis and the epiglottis, that whole, you know, we have, how I many, I think it's either seven or nine tubes that come into the throat region. Yeah, it's amazing. It's an odd number. Uh, so let's count them for a moment. Let's see. We have the most obvious one from the mouth, right? So that's one, then down the esophagus is two and the trachea is three. But then we have two sets, uh, two, three sets, three more sets. We have the nostrils, which are two more, so that's five. Then we have the eustachian tubes. Eustachian tubes, everybody know the eustachian tubes? Take a look, look them up. Eustachian tubes, little tiny tubes that go from the inner ear to the throat. Right? We get there. And so when you close your eye, your ears, you can pop, you know, to equalize because the tympanic membrane, right? It's a delicate membrane and it's just a thin tissue and it needs equal pressure on both sides. Otherwise it'll pop in or out <laughs> and you can break the tympanic membrane with excess pressure either inside or outside. Uh, I know that from, uh, from diving. So you have to equalize uh, periodically when you're diving, you have to push air in to the inner ear to equalize the pressure. And so those little tubes were discovered by a Greek uh, doctor, I guess he was way back in the classical time. And he was Eustachius, <laughs> it was his name. So he, how about for, how was that for a uh, paradigm? 
have your name on the tubes there for millennia, <laughs> the station tubes. So that's two more. So that makes uh, seven, right? All right. The nostrils were five, the station to seven. And the last one, the last two. It's associated with uh, the eyes. The eyes. The lacrimals, lacrimals, they come from the tears, right? So when you pour teardrops sometimes on your eyes, after a while you can taste it. <laughs> and I guess it's just a series of cells that go down into that. I don't really know that what, what function it has. Maybe it's vestigial or maybe it's... Uh, or a side effect of... Could be. Could be. But uh, I really haven't looked at it in detail. Maybe one of you wants to look at it for uh, just out of curiosity, maybe a cross section or something of the tissue to see there must be some kind of cells that go down or maybe a, an actual tube from the lacrimals into the mouth. So there are nine tubes that come into the mouth, okay, mm, into the throat. And all those tubes go, come and come, go to different places. But the, I guess some of the most critical one is the esophagus and the trachea, which the esophagus liquids and solids and the trachea only gases. <laughs> uh, because if we get liquids or solids into the trachea, that goes to the lungs and what happens? Aspirate and then it's called aspiration pneumonia because what we eat and drink is not sterile, right? It's full of bacteria and fungi and spores and all kinds of uh, things, microscopic, but uh, the tissue inside the lungs is a nice culture tissue <laughs> for all of these bugs, all right? So that's called aspiration pneumonia and um, it's uh, bad news. So when a person has difficulty swallowing or choking or coughing, even just from a sip of water or something like that, or liquid, then they do a swallow test. This is an, it's the indication, all right? And the swallow test determines the capacity of a, per, of a patient to swallow. And they will try first with regular water and then they will thicken the water or the fluid a little bit Typically they use like cornstarch or something like that and they can make that water pretty thick, almost viscous, hmm? which is harder to choke on because it has a little more consistency, viscosity to it. Hmm. So that's the swallow test. And it's done by a technician in, uh, in the lab, in a clinic, at the hospital to determine whether the patient may be able to swallow or not. If the patient is not able to swallow, then what is uh, indicated is an NPO, all right? And it, that's typically what will be posted on top of the bed on the wall, big sign NPO, which means nothing per oral. Oral is a reference to the mouth, nothing by mouth. So do not give this patient anything by mouth. Not a candy, not a sip of water. They're gonna ask you for water because they're, the mouth is dry and they may be hydrated, the body may be hydrated, but the sensation of dehydration because the mouth is dry, okay? And it's two separate things. The mouth, the dry mouth is just local sensation, but it doesn't mean that the body is necessarily dehydrated. Conversely, a body may be dehydrated and not feel the dry mouth, so people may not drink enough water because they feel they're, they think they're fine. They don't feel thirsty, uh, but they are in fact dehydrated. And that happens when we work out a lot uh, outside, we sweat a lot, we perspire, lose water, um, and we have to replenish that even though we, don't, we may not have the sensation of thirst, okay? So two separate issues. Mm. So the nothing per oral typically is given for a number of purposes to prevent aspiration pneumonia, for example, people who are having difficulty swallow, or if a person is uh, gonna go undergo general anesthesia uh, six to 12 hours before the, the operation, the surgery, why, why with general anesthesia? There's a tendency if there is liquid or food 
in the stomach with anesthesia, uh, sometimes the patient will regurgitate, but they're unconscious. And that regurgitation can go down to the lungs and cause aspiration pneumonia. So in the middle of surgery, you don't want the patient to be getting aspiration pneumonia, okay, because of regurgitation. So that's why typically surgeries are done on an empty stomach, hmm? which typically is like the night before or something like that. They stop, they put the MPO. The person may have a weak swallowing reflex uh, due to old age or some debilitating condition of the throat. There could be bleeding or blockage of the stomach or the intestines, and therefore the person should not continue to put food <laughs> down the tube, all right? Bleeding is one issue, uh, ulcers, for example, the stomach, uh, or a blockage, intestinal blockage, because um, they didn't drink enough water with the bolus. Always hydrate your food very well. Really hydrate your food well to make a soft stool. Otherwise, what happens is the intestines will uh, suck out what little food is there and um, in the... Um, uh, well, it's called chyme and chyle going up to the stomach, uh, the food, and it becomes hard, and then people don't have a bowel movement, and they'll hold that chyme or chyle two, three, four days. That's very bad news. You know, you should really have a bowel movement. The ideal is to have bowel movement every day, all right, with soft stool. That's, that's uh, healthy. And uh, since I'm on that, and then I'll walk away from it. If anyone, if you know anyone who is having difficulty having bowel movements, sometimes it occurs in the elderly, typically because they don't drink enough water, you know, a glass of warm water first thing in the morning. When the person wakes up first thing in the morning, as hot as they tolerate it, don't, they don't have to burn themselves, you know, but as, as hot as they can tolerate it, just tap water. Uh, first thing in the morning, a nice tall glass of warm water. What does that do? First thing down the tubes, down the, down the intestines. Yes. Sorry, Derek? What? I was saying it loosens, every, it loosens your bowels and everything to make it like more easier to, uh, I guess, flow, right? To have, to have a movement, yes, exactly what it does, that warm water, first of all, you know, we're 98 degrees inside, 97, 98 degrees inside, which is very hot. If we were at 98 degrees in a room, Fahrenheit, it would be very, very hot, right? <laughs> no air conditioning. <laughs> so that's the internal temperature of the core. And so what that does is it stimulates the intestines to do peristalsis, precisely, to start peristalsis, okay? So it stimulates the intestines for peristalsis and facilitates the bowel movement. So highly recommended. Sometimes maybe family member and elderly, you know, is having difficulty with movements. And it's very dangerous for a, any person, but especially if you're the elderly, to retain their stool three, four days. Sometimes they have to be taken to the hospital. Enema, you name it, to try to clean them out, all right? So, okay. So when the indication is um, nothing per oral, then we have to consider how we're gonna provide nutrition and hydration to the patient, right? Okay, so that's what we call medically assisted nutrition and hydration. Now notice the word is assisted, not substituted. <laughs> okay, that's why I'm sticking, I'm trying to have a consistency with the language here. If it's assisting, then in principle, it obligates, right? Because it's not substituting. Medically assisted nutrition and hydration means that we're gonna essentially bypass the throat, but the throat as such is not a vital organ. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it can be bypassed. So the fact that nutrition and or hydration are being medically assisted doesn't mean that they are extraordinary means of life support, not necessarily. We still have to look at each particular patient to see if that medically assisted nutrition or hydration is for this particular patient uh, ordinary or extraordinary. Remember, in the judgment of the patient. Okay, so patient for one patient, it may be ordinary, like an IV, 
uh, for hydration. For another patient, that same IV may be extraordinary, all right? Depending on a lot of things. So there are two ways to provide medically assisted nutrition and hydration. And they are enteral or parenteral, okay? So enteral is a reference to the digestive tract, the enterum, all right? It's a reference to the digestive tract, the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract. Gastro meaning stomach, intestinal, the intestines. So the GI tract is the digestive system from the stomach down. Parenteral, think of parenteral as peripheral, okay? Parenteral, it's not enteral, it's outside of the enteral. So it's not the GI tract, it is the circulatory system directly into the bloodstream, all right? Into the veins. So this one is a PN, parenteral nutrition, and it involves a line, a line meaning that uh, typically they call it a pick line to enter into the veins, all right? And uh, that line will have a port so that the, the line will be established, either the subclavian or sometimes in the uh, arms or sometimes the legs, wherever they can find uh, a vein. Mm -hmm. And then once that line is established, it will have a little port, meaning that that's where the needle goes in and they don't have to be pricking the patient every time they need to provide uh, the nutrition or the hydration. So it's called a PIC line, P-I-C. All right, let's look a little bit in detail for enteral. So this is enteral nutrition. There are three main ways of uh, providing um, nutrition and hydration to the GI tract, all right? Either through the nose or through the stomach directly. And through the nose can go down to the stomach or beyond the stomach and directly into the intestine, the jejunum, which is the beginning of the intestine, of the small intestine, right after the stomach, all right? It's a tube that goes through the nose, flexible, medium thickness uh, tube, all the way into the stomach, but if there's an ulcer or something like that and the stomach needs to be bypassed, it will go directly into the jejunum. So you notice different types of food can be put down here. For example, if it's a NG tube, nasogastric, right? NG, nasogastric tube. Then basically you could put down that tube pureed food, all right? Pureed because it's going into the stomach where it's going to be digested. But if it's an NJ tube going to the jejunum, then uh, the food has to be a little different because it's no longer gonna be digested at the stomach. It's basically digestion will finish in the, in the intestines and then absorption. So specifically uh, greases and fats and oils, uh, well, that's okay because of the bile, but um, uh, proteins, you know, proteins are digested in the stomach and not in the intestines. So this, this uh, feeding here, you would need already the amino acids in the nutrition. So it's more, this type of nutrition is more specialized nutrition. Okay, the NJ tube. Whereas the NG tube nutrition is just pureed food, put it in a blender and put it down the tube. <laughs> then the third one, is the percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, or PEG for short, and God for acronyms, <laughs> just the PEG. And the PEG is fairly common also, also because these, these tubes through the nose cannot be sustained uh, indefinitely. It's a little bit like the trach, remember the, uh, the, um, the vent, no more than two, three weeks maximum. I think these NG and NJ tubes, uh, maybe one or two weeks, they're prone to infection, irritation, and so forth. So they cannot be sustained for a long period of time. It's short term, all right? 
short term while the patient is recovering from something that has a good prognosis. But if it's more long term, including PVS, then the PEG is indicated. All right. Now, even though it's a big word and it sounds uh, challenging, it's minor surgery, it's local anesthesia. Let's take it from backwards and work forward. Gastrostomy, all right, gastro is a uh, reference to the stomach. Stomy is a hole, stoma, like the stomata on the cell, all right, it's a hole, it's an opening. So it's a hole through the stomach. Endoscopic, because it's guided by endoscopy. There is um, a camera, essentially, that is put down the throat into the stomach to monitor things, all right? That's called an endoscopy. It's an endoscope, basically a camera tube. <laughs> and percutaneous, because it goes through the skin. Cutaneous is a reference to the skin, all right? So percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, PEG, Essentially, a tube to the stomach. Tube to the stomach. I'll show you some diagrams here in a minute. Mm. First, the general diagram of ports of entry for enteral nutrition. All right, so some enteral axis. Here is the NG or NJ tube, depending if it's going to the stomach or the jejunum. And then uh, here is the peg right through the walls of the abdomen into the stomach. All right, so these are ports of entry. Talked about that already. Now, parenteral. I mentioned is on, it's uh, avoiding the enteral because for some reason the Digestive tract is not functioning well, so it has to be bypassed. We can still feed the patient. It's more specialized uh, uh, feeding. There it has to be essential nutrients uh, because you're not going to put food directly into uh, a person's veins, right? In other words, uh, to begin with, food is not sterilized, so that will cause a massive <laughs> sepsis uh, for the patient uh, infection. So it has to be essential nutrients, which are sterilized. They come in a bag. Typically, it's a white liquid. It looks a little bit like sap. <laughs> mm. uh, and it goes through the veins. Why the veins and not the arteries? Why is it uh, intravenous, IV? What happens in the arteries? Which, uh, which of the two circulations, uh, you know, we have uh, arterial circulation, we have venous circulation. Which of the two circulations takes the heartbeat? In other words, the pressure of the diastole and systole of the heart. 120, you know, 120 over 80 PSI, right? Okay, 120 pounds per square inch. That's a pretty substantial pressure. And who takes that beat? The arteries or the veins? Yes, even a hint is the arteries are flexible, right? to take and they expand when the heart contracts, the arteries expand somewhat, they're elastic, to take that pressure and then they'll contract and by contracting, they'll push the blood forward systemically to the tissues where the blood needs to go. And then through capillaries, gas exchange, nutrient exchange, and it comes back through venous circulation, back to the heart, which is a pump. And so if we were to put an IV, if we were to put a, uh, a needle into an artery, what's gonna happen? We're gonna get squirts of blood coming out, okay? <laughs> Not good. <laughs> so we go into the veins that are on a return circulation. So that rotation is actually gonna go through the heart and then out through the arteries to the, uh, to the tissues of the body, all right? And same sum on that, how, do, how does venous circulation go back to the heart? Because we don't have like little pumps, you know, we, don't, we don't have a million little hearts at the end of the, uh, at the capillaries, right, going into the venous circulation. So how does venous circulation go back? How does the venous blood go back to the heart? 
it will lose the arterial pressure by the time we get to the capillaries because there's a ramification, right? So by the time it's like a pebble in the middle of the pond, the ripples are strongest, nearest where the pebble landed. And then by the time it gets to the shoreline, it, that, that wave has dissipated, right? So that's what happens to the pressure is basically lost at the diffuse throughout the body at the level of capillaries. So the return circulation is interesting because veins, unlike arteries, they have little valves that are one-way valves, okay? And you can see them when, well, I have a little rash there, but if you uh, ignore the rash for a moment and you put your uh, arm down like that and you'll see these little, little things popping, little balls, <laughs> all right? Those little balls popping, those are the little valves, okay? And they're one-way valves so that the uh, blood goes up and cannot flow back, you know, backflow. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically a squishing because the veins go in between the muscles. And when we move our muscles, then that's squishing the blood back up through the veins and it can back down because of the little valves when everything is functioning properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so little by little, all that pushing and squishing will push the blood back up into the heart where it will be pumped back to the arterial. And uh, so we also have two circulations, right? We have a, uh, a systemic circulation, meaning to the body, to the tissues of the body. And we also have a pulmonary circulation for the gas exchange. Mm -hmm. All right. so. Back to parenteral nutrition is through an IV and it avoids the GI tract, goes directly into uh, the uh, venous system. And there are two types. One is partial parenteral nutrition, PPN, and the other one is total parenteral nutrition, TPN. And this is the most common one, by the way, the TPN. So you'll see TPN, you know, which is a reference for total parental nutrition, means that all the essential nutrients are being supplied to this particular patient through, uh, through an IV. Partial, mm, I don't know exactly, can I give you an example, but partial is when a particular patient, because of their condition, only needs some nutrients, some essential nutrients to be supplied. I don't know if it's electrolytes or whatever, or it could be just uh, hydration, for example, a saline solution, right? But uh, TPN is the one that has all of the essential nutrients, amino acids, you name it, all the minerals and so forth, needed for the body to function properly, all right? It's more delicate, it's more involved, uh, parental nutrition, because, oh, okay, before I go there, so here are some ports of entry, typically they're looking for uh, major veins that are going to the heart, at the base of the neck, the uh, jugular, for example, mm -hmm. subclavian underneath the clavicle. These are the clavicles, these bony things here, right? Uh, the, this one is also the femoral, goes into, uh, what's this one? Vena cava, right? When the, when the doctor goes like this with his hands down here, her hands, I always laugh when <laughs> he does that. He's checking for the pulse on the vena or the uh, flow of the vena cava. So the various, and this is what I mean by a port, all right? These little gadgets where needles are inserted. They have to be maintained, they have to be kept clean and so forth uh, because they can get, if an infection goes in here, it goes right into the circulatory system. And for the elderly, sometimes it's hard to find a vein, they tend to collapse because they become frail, thin, and uh, sometimes takes a specialized nurse to be able to catch the vein for an elderly person, the very thin, flexible needles. All right, so TPN is concentrated and some uh, issues with it, they can cause uh, thrombosis because they can get stuck inside, all right? And so it's not usually 
used for patients that have an, an intact GI tract. In other words, that the intestines, stomach and intestines are working fine. So um, parental is not indicated. But uh, when the GI tract needs rest or has some kind of disorder, then that's when uh, it's indicated. All right, so let's go back to the bioethical analysis itself. Well, a little bit more here. Mm. In principle, it is ordinary care, all right? Ordinary means of life support, even if it has to be medically assisted because it's just providing nutrition and hydration, which are, is part of uh, ordinary care. This slide's a little backwards uh, mixed up. I should move this. Uh, here, right after, there, sorry. This is a little more detail of the PEG. I want to uh, focus on the PEG because that's the case with Terry Shower, the case that we were gonna look at. Since the uh, NG tubes and NJ tubes are uh, temporary, usually the patient has a good prognosis and they'll recover and the tubes come out, but if the patient is in a coma or PBS, they need to be nourished, they need to be hydrated, and so the PEG is the indication, all right? But then, when to remove the PEG or leave it on, because if uh, the patient is in PBS, certainly they cannot swallow on their own, they're, they're unconscious, and removing the PEG will essentially kill the patient, or are we allowing the patient to die? Well, it depends on the condition, right? It depends on the diagnosis and the prognosis. So this is how, look, this is the diagram. Here's a stomach, has a little balloon on the inside and a little cup on the outside to make a nice snug fit between the abdominal wall. This would be muscle and this would be skin, all right? Or fat and then skin. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the peg there. And it's a wide tube, fairly wide, similar to the one, the NG or NJ, ends with a cap here, and that's sealed when it's not being used. Uh, when it's being used, uh, it's a large bore syringe or plunger where the nutrition is poured in here. And here, nutrition and hydration are done together, okay? So there will be shakes of different types. And, uh, just put the food in the blender and plenty of water so that it's nice and hydrated. It's a mush, right? And then it's plunged down into uh, the person's stomach directly. This is an actual photo, what it looks like. There's the navel for location, all right? And that's the little cap on the outside and on the inside there's that little balloon. And here is the, the port. Now, is the patient tasting anything? Not tasting. So you can put into the blender spinach, steak, ice cream, strawberries, whatever you want to throw in there because the patient is not tasting anything. The important thing is that the patient gets well nourished. <laughs> so the more various the food is, uh, the better the patient will be uh, nourished and use plenty of water to do that, that um, that mush mm -hmm. uh, so that together, simultaneously, the patient is being nourished and hydrated, all right? Okay, so that's the peg. Any uh, questions so far? All right, very straightforward. Now, we go to the bioethical analysis and the ERDs also give us guidance here. There are three ERDs that are associated with uh, nutrition and hydration, and they're gonna hovering around precisely what is proportionate and what is disproportionate. So 56, 57, and 58. 56 is essentially, person has a, an obligation for ordinary means of mm, preserving life proportionate or ordinary means of preserving life, including nutrition and hydration, right? Unless, uh, and especially if it's offering reasonable hope of benefit and does not entail excessive burden. So here's the benefit burden analysis. Then 57, 
is going to be the converse. In other words, a person may forego extraordinary or disproportionate means of preserving life. And what are disproportionate in the patient's judgment? Patient's judgment. They're disproportionate if they do not offer reasonable hope of benefit or entail excessive burden. So they're pretty straightforward. Okay. And then 58 is referring specifically to nutrition and hydration, meaning that in principle, in principle, nutrition and hydration are considered ordinary means of life support, even if they have to be medically assisted even they have to be provided medically, right? So that the patient cannot NPO, then we go enteral or parenteral. So that's what it means here. Even if it is medically assisted, in principle, nutrition and hydration are considered uh, ordinary means of life support. So they are bioethically obligatory. But as long as they provide sufficient benefit and uh, not excessive burdens. Keep saying in principle, which is uh, pointing to exceptions. And there are basically two exceptions when nutrition and hydration uh, become extraordinary means of life support and therefore did not obligate uh, bioethically. All right. These two exceptions, when the nutrition and or hydration can no longer be absorbed or assimilated, or when in the estimation of the dying patient, Nutrition and hydration become an excessive burden. So let's look at them in a little bit more detail. One is more physiological, and the other one is more psychological. Okay. These two exceptions. So absorb or assimilate it. Where does absorption occur normally of nutrition and or hydration? The intestines. So if the intestines are not functioning well, all right, there's intestinal collapse or they, uh, they're not functioning, right? Remember, that's why I included the intestines as a vital organ. So if the intestines are not functioning well and they are, are malfunctioning irreversibly, the death process has begun. Maybe subtle, but it's real. To keep feeding that person is contraindicated because that nutrition and hydration is not being absorbed and they're gonna get impacted, they're gonna get uh, uh, start having difficulty with uh, bowel movement. All right, then assimilation occurs at the other end of the body. Where is assimilation? No, assimilation is actually through the bloodstream in the tissues. If the food is not being, if the nutrition is not being assimilated by the tissues, so the tissues are shutting down vital organs, you know, if uh, the liver is no longer functioning well, all the other vital organs are no longer functioning well, that's where assimilation occurs of the nutrition and hydration. You follow me? Okay. So either absorption or assimilation is not working well, it's pointing to the collapse of vital organs. And therefore, at that point, nutrition and hydration may be contraindicated, all right? and they are no longer ordinary, they become extraordinary means. So that's not more on the physiological side. On the psychological side, in the estimation of the dying patient, they consider this to be an excessive burden. I don't wanna get any more the peg. See the peg, especially the, 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 um, the very challenging combination is a peg on an elderly because are we used to having a, a, a tube through our stomach? We're not used to having a tube through our stomach. So the natural instinct is what? Pull it out, <laughs> okay? So what do you do with an elderly person who's demented, right? And they have a peg, uh, you gotta start pulling that tube out. So what do you do? You gotta tie them down. Now you got an elderly patient who's tied down. They're gonna start wrestling with that. So it starts becoming inhumane. <laughs> All right, so it may be a point where the patient is not necessarily dying, they're chronic, but, but they're not dying, but a, a peg may be contraindicated, okay? And so it's challenging, but these are the decisions at the end of life. 
Okay, now I want to look at a particular case because she was young. Hmm? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, it, it kind of becomes uh, about like the police between what might amount to some kind of torture, psychological torture. Yes. Or allowing someone to possibly show up for that. Right. And so that's a very delicate point and very valid because what we're calling starving to death, the body also has a process that becomes somewhat anesthetized when we are slowly. So there is malnutrition and there is dehydration, right? And on average, which one will kill us first? Malnutrition or dehydration by far. Depending on how plump we are and how well fed we are, we may last up to a month without eating all right, uh, solids, that's malnutrition, we're malnourished, uh, because the body goes into something that is known as what? Self-consumption or muscle waste, all right? So the body starts self-digesting. If there's no food coming in, the body will start digesting itself, go through the fat tissue first, and there's no more fat, it'll start going through the muscle tissue, <laughs> breaking it down and, and, and using the essential nutrients there. So um, it's self-digestion and um, self-consumption, and that's why people literally malnourished, they get skinny, all right? Uh, but it may last up to a month in that process. Whereas hydration, three, four, five days without water, kidney failure, you know, the kidneys are gonna shut down because the kidneys need the water to get rid of what? There's osmoregulation, but the kidney, see the, the toxic waste of the body, the toxins of the body, metabolic waste, right? Needs to be excel, expelled, especially uh, the ammonias, the, the nitrogen uh, compounds, uh, which is a byproduct of metabolism, specifically of breaking down proteins. And so that has to be eliminated through um, the urine and if there's no more water to pull out of the tissues of the body, all right, then the body starts intoxicating itself and uh, the kidneys at some point shut down. And so three, four, five, six days, depends on each person, but that's kind of, I'm saying a week is a long time to be without drinking any water. So we die of dehydration before we die of malnutrition. And but what happens also, what I want to point out is as um, we go into the self-consumption, the brain also starts releasing certain uh, chemicals and uh, it, it begins to shut down the brain a little bit and it uh, numbs, it's kind of an internal anesthetic. It numbs the, for a while we may feel hunger, but after a while that hunger sensation also goes away and we no longer feel hungry. And a nurse actually explained to me once, it's not that we, how did she put it? It's not that we no longer feel hungry because we're starving, it's that we don't feel hungry because we're dying. <laughs> and so, the body no longer needs nourishment. When there are vital organs that are failing, it's difficult to get people to eat. For example, people with a terminal cancer, they don't want to eat anymore, right? And that's aside from the chemo that makes them nauseous and all that. Let's say they stop the chemo, right? But they don't want to eat anymore. And it's like the body is saying, why are you feeding me? Because I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm dying, <laughs> all right? So, the brain secretes certain substances that will take away the sensation of, um, of hunger. And they don't really feel that hungry. It's kind of a, an aesthetic. So whether it's cruel or not, sometimes it's more the perception of the person wasting away than what the person is actually feeling internally. Now, I know I'm speaking mostly at the physiological level. Psychologically, we don't really know exactly what they're feeling, right? But at least physiologically, um, 
what I'm trying to say is that starving to death may be more painful to watch than to experience <laughs> on, one, on one side. And, but it's a delicate, it's a very delicate situation. And I think that this in the estimation of the patient is very important, it's paramount, all right? It needs to be respected. Now, in a civilized society like ours, there are always analgesics, right? Painkillers that will help the patient if they have a sensation of pain or, or aches or something that can be managed. And that's the proper way to go either hospice or palliative care. Okay, I want to get to the case of uh, Terry. How many of you ever heard of uh, Terry Schiavo? Yes, no, okay. I remember watching the, uh, long time ago watching the updates. And in the, the news and in the protests, yes, yes. It took her quite a while. But it did, yeah. Uh, uh, she was on PBS for 16 years, actually, after, after her collapse. Uh, is this an I? Sorry. Anyway, um, this is her as a young lady. Um, and this is her towards the end of her life. You can see that she had a trach, she had tracheotomy, but uh, she was breathing on her own. The heart was beating on, on its own, but she had a peg and she was in PBS for 16 years. <laughs> so let's look at her case for a moment. There's a timeline. And I have it in here. No, modules, modules, module 10. So module 10, there's a little timeline there. It's uh, an Excel. This is the, the abridged version, okay? The longer version is a much more detail. I uh, can send you that too. But this is just kind of compressed. She was born in the, oh, hold on, there's one more there. This is the dateline here on column A and her age as we go along in years and the event. So she was born in uh, 1963, right, Pennsylvania, and she married when she was 20. She married Michael Schiavo. All right, so uh, Schindler, I guess it's a, a German name originally, they were uh, the parents. And Michael was 21 when they married, so about the same age, more or less, young couple. Uh, before going further, I want to mention also that this name is pronounced, how do you pronounce that? Can you, is that too small? Maybe a little bigger. Right, so when the news was going on, you know, Michael Schiavo, Michael Schiavo, you hear different pronunciations. Uh, it's actually, it's an Italian last name, and I can tell you that that is pronounced Schiavo, all right? Because just like my last name, C-I-O, is pronounced Trophy, so C-I is pronounced C-H. However, C-H-I is pronounced K, it's a hard C. So C-I and C-E are soft Cs, uh, whereas C-H in Italian is pronounced as a K. It's called a hard C. So this is actually pronounced schiavo. And anyone know what schiavo is in Italian? In Espanol, esclavo, <laughs> slave. <laughs> Slave, yeah, that's what it means, slave. And I found it so ironic because certainly Michael didn't choose his last name, right? <laughs> it was inherited from his parents. And as you see going through the drama of a tragedy of um, this couple, right? Uh, he was kind of, in my mind, he was a slave to himself for all the things that happened. But it was certainly very, very challenging uh, this case as was going on. Let's look at it a little bit, just the highlights. Six years into the marriage, they, uh, she collapsed in the middle of the night, all right? They had a little townhouse, they were living near the parents. So the parents had moved to Florida 
for retirement. So Terry and Michael came down. They were having a good relationship with their parents at that time, with her parents and so forth. So they were living near each other uh, in the west coast of Florida. And in the middle of the night, she collapsed. The assumption is that she had a potassium imbalance and went into cardiac arrest. Uh, apparently she was dieting at the time and was doing some kind of crazy diets and maybe that led to a potassium imbalance which led to uh, a heart attack and collapsed in the middle of the night. Michael didn't find her until several hours later when he got up and saw her lying on the floor, called 911, rescue came couldn't revive her, rushed her to the hospital and uh, intubated. And uh, because she wasn't waking up, they put a peg to feed her, all right? They put a peg. So that was under emergency at the hospital. So now she's with a peg and she's uh, unconscious. Michael, of course, is the legitimate husband of uh, Terry. So he's the uh, guardian. Uh, proxy, et cetera. So later that uh, year, she's not waking up, all right? He takes her for experimental treatment in California. So they put an implant, uh, brain stimulator, doesn't work. So they come back to Florida. Uh, now it's been a year and she's still not waking up, but the ventilator, she's not at a vent. She has a tracheotomy, so she can breathe through the trach. Her heart is beating on its own, normal. All she has is a peg to her stomach to keep her nourished and hydrated, all right? So medically assisted nutrition and hydration. Uh, but she is uh, at this point in PBS because it's beyond six months, which is kind of the cutoff between coma and PBS. Another year, and there's a malpractice suit that awards Terry over a million dollars. Most of that money goes into a trust for her medical needs, okay? Now, there begins to be a friction between the parents of Terry and Michael because uh, they don't agree on the therapy. Uh, the Schindlers want more aggressive therapy to be done and swallow tests and all kinds of things on Terry. Michael wants Terry to be left alone, uh, see if she wakes up kind of on her own, uh, but nothing is working. She's been through a lot of um, uh, types of therapies and she's not waking up. All right, the problem is that you see with the heart attack, uh, there was uh, hypoxia, maybe anoxia, and we don't know for how long, but certainly more than a few minutes, maybe several hours. So there was no oxygen to the brain for a substantial amount of time, all right? But is she brain dead? No, why? Heart is beating. She's breathing on her own. So at least it's not total brain death. The brain stem is working. We don't know about the cortex. She couldn't move. She couldn't move. However, there was some kind of, sometimes there is involuntary movement that occurs with, uh, with uh, patients who are in PBS. Sometimes we go like this. Or the typical thing for patients in PBS is Someone comes into the room and they'll follow them with their eyes. It's called tracking, but it's involuntary. All right, that's been proven that it's involuntary tracking. It just because the eyes are so accustomed to following, to tracking, that they do it even unconsciously. <laughs> All right, and she had her eyes open, but it's not, uh, it was blank. But the brainstem is working because she's, her heart is beating on her own, on, her, on its own, lungs are breathing on their own. So uh, where are we? Yeah. So here we are, 34. All right. It's been eight years now. This is the I'm giving you the very abridged version. Michael wants her disconnected. 
but he uh, he doesn't divorce her. In the meantime, Michael starts a relationship with another woman and has a child with this other woman, her name, Jody Centonzi, who was another Italian, by the way. <laughs> and it's an open relationship. You know, they're walking around, they're going to the movies together, to dinner together, people are seeing them. And so it's like psychologically, Michael has moved away from Terry as his wife and now has this other relationship, but he doesn't divorce Terry. So they ask, well, why don't you divorce, you know, if you're moving on? And according to him, he says, because I want Terry's wishes to be followed. And Terry's wishes was that she didn't want to live that way, all right? Now, there were no, there was no advanced directives, no living will, nothing like this. Michael claims that one time they had a, him and Terry were having dinner and the conversation came up, PBS and a peg, you know, it, it came up in the conversation just between the two of them. There was no one else there. And to quote Michael, Terry said, I wouldn't want to live that way. I would not want to live that way, All right? That was Terry's uh, words. So we have to take it at face value that Michael is, has Terry's best interest. The challenge here and the caveat is that if uh, Michael divorces Terry, then he loses the, the million dollars because those are in Terry's fund uh, for her care until she dies. And if she dies, then who gets to inherit? The husband. So if he divorces Terry, then there's no inheritance. So there's the background of the million dollars, right? Uh, that he would inherit if Terry died while he was still husband. But he claims that he's not doing it for that, he's doing it because Terry says she wouldn't want to live that way. The Schindlers, being the parents of Terry, they don't want to lose their daughter, they, they never lose hope that she's going to wake up even after years and years. You know, there's always, you can always find an article somewhere that someone woke up. I remember one, one time reading years ago, someone, I think it was a prisoner actually, the prisoner was in PBS in, in, in prison and needed a root canal and went to the dentist. And while the dentist is doing the root canal, the guy woke up <laughs> after being, you know, in a coma for years. So you can always find these extraordinary situations that do occur, but they're, they're flukes, they're very odd, they have no medical explanation. And so the Schindlers are holding on, hung, holding on to dear life to see if their daughter, their precious daughter is gonna wake up or not, okay? And that's why now begins the court battles. And the Schindlers go to court to try to prevent Michael from disconnecting Terry from taking out the peg. Uh, so it, it starts, the back and forth starts there. He gets, uh, Judge Greer uh, is the one who is uh, adjudicating here in Florida. So he adjudicates, Judge Greer has to go by the law. Michael is the legal uh, agent of Terry. It's, uh, he's her husband and so he speaks on her, he's the proxy, he speaks on her behalf, all right, he's the legal guardian. Regardless of the affair, the fact that he's being unethical by having an open affair with another woman while he's still married to Terry is a different issue, it's a moral issue, but it's not a legal issue. And so the, the court has to rule in favor of Michael speaking on Terry's behalf. So the judge orders the peg to be removed. Mm -hmm. And they removed the peg the first time. Here we are, she's at 37. She collapsed when she was 26. She's been on the peg for 11 years. PBS, all right, 11 years. All cancer therapies, prognosis, abysmal. So uh, with uh, the trials, what happens is the Schindlers have to exhaust all the legal options, right? And they keep um, challenging the, the judgment of, of uh, Judge Greer. So 
they get another judge to reinstate the peg. And so Terry is put back onto the peg a few days later, uh, two days later. Second time, she's, the peg is reinstated. That's the, so that's the second peg <laughs> that goes in. More legal battles back and forth, back and forth for about three years. Finally, uh, the peg is removed a second time. About a week later, the peg is reinstated again. All right, so now she's gone in and out of the peg twice. And so the peg goes back in a third time. Two more years of court battles until finally the Shinderas exhaust all of the legal options. But this also spilled over. At that time, the Bush brothers were uh, uh, in politics. And so this was what years? Yeah, the beginning of yeah, 2005. Okay, so you remember in Florida, it was Jeb Bush was the governor. And uh, in, in DC, in, uh, in the White House, was W, George W. Bush, his brother, okay? So what happens? Jeb gets the Florida legislature to craft a law specifically for Terry, all right? And in fact, it's known as Terry's Law. You can look it up, Terry's Law here in Florida, where that was when the peg went in the, the second time, all right? To try to um, save Terry's life from dying from malnutrition because, because when you disconnect the, the peg or dehydration, right? Whichever comes first. And uh, so Jeb Bush gets involved. The Florida Supreme Court gets involved because all the, the appeals are exhausted at the state level, okay? The Florida Supreme Court, um, uh, rules in favor of removing the peg. They do another appeal to a district court beyond Florida. It even reached the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, um, uh, rejected uh, to hear the case. They didn't want to hear it. All right. So they didn't uh, try on it. So it came back to Florida. It says this should be resolved by the lower courts. And so they did not hear this case in the Supreme Court in the, uh, of the United States because they didn't want the precedent to be set, basically. Mm -hmm. Big implications. Mm. W, George W got involved in the case also, trying to maintain the peg <laughs> for Terry. It happens that at that time, even John Paul II, because the Schindlers uh, are Catholic, and Terry and Michael were Catholic. They had married in the Catholic Church. They were trying to follow Catholic teaching, you know, and not kill Terry mm, because they're thinking nutrition and hydration are ordinary means, but they forgot the two exceptions, <laughs> all right, that it can become extraordinary in the estimation of the patient or the patients, in this case, the patient's proxy, who was Michael. Uh, because, but because Michael was having this unethical behavior, then... Uh, the Schindlers just weren't believing that he was saying the truth. He just wanted the inheritance. So you see how it gets very, very uh, murky. Turns out that at that time, uh, it was John Paul II who was the Pope, and he was addressing the, um, some group of uh, anesthesiologists, I think it was, in uh, Rome uh, at the Vatican. It was uh, an international conference of uh, anesthesiologist or something like that. And the issue came up bioethically of nutrition and hydration in the case of, uh, of a PVS uh, patient, persistent vegetative state. And John Paul II had an intervention in that uh, conference and talked about that, that even if medically assisted nutrition and hydration in principle should be considered ordinary means. Right, so those are things that came out. In fact, that Directive 58, I remember because I was working for the NCBC at that time, the National Catholic uh, Bioethics uh, uh, Center in Philadelphia, and that Directive 58, 58 was being uh, drafted at the time to include 
the people teaching that in principle, it should be uh, ordinary means of uh, life support, nutrition and hydration, even if medically assisted, all right? But keeping in mind the two exceptions. And so the Schindlers went to Rome, spoke to the Pope, the Pope, not knowing the specifics of the details, uh, kind of suggested that she should be, be kept on the peg because that's what was keeping her alive. So this, and it, uh, you can imagine the secular news and even religious news, they're having a feeding frenzy on this, right? <laughs> because this is going on, not months, this is for years, kind of similar to Maynard, Britain Maynard, but expanded for years. So it was sure sensational news periodically whenever there was some kind of decision that happened either on the courts, on the, on the church, there were demonstrations going on, which get getting bigger and bigger. Those maybe uh, some that you mentioned, Louis, that you saw in the news, uh, people with, uh, with um, signs and, and placards, they were making vigils out there, all night vigils. Uh, Somehow it had the perception of the pro-life movement, right? Because uh, it was not only beginning of life here was end of life, not to euthanize uh, uh, Terry. So the pro-life uh, groups of the state and they were coming in from out of state and, and staging demonstrations there. And then the pro-choice people got into it also. No, you should let Terry die. It's her body. She wants to die, let her alone. Back and forth, the police had to come in. At some point, I think it was even National Guard had to come in to push the hundreds of people away she was isolated and secluded and no one was allowed to come into uh, the nursing home uh, by or court order. It was a huge, huge to do in the news for months and years. Uh, until finally, the third time that the peg was uh, removed, then essentially there was a, a cordon of um, a security zone established all around her for, for, for maybe 100 feet or something or 200 feet outside of, uh, of the home where she was, days, weeks, I think it was what, two or three weeks that she lasted from the 18th to the 31, 14 days, two weeks, dehydrating until she was just consumed, consumed. You know, you can see some photos on the news in the, online where she's very, very uh, uh, skinny and she died. All right, and so finally, when the autopsy is done on that brain, the coroner declared that there was so much neuronal damage on that brain that there was no hope of recovery, really. There was no hope that those neurons would have ever been regenerated. It was massive. It was like mush, okay? So that was the case of uh, Terry Schiavo and the long and short is that she was on the peg for 16 years in vegetative state. She was not dead, she was not dying, but this is kind of the extreme example of where what starts as an ordinary means of life support at some point may become extraordinary means. Of life support, right? And how to make that decision uh, can be very difficult, challenging, messy. What do you think? Well, first I have a question. Yeah. So when you say it shows that she was in PBS and there's a mess about that, is that talking about an accumulated loss from the ones over the years? Or in because of the two weeks or so. So it's not known because the autopsy is only done after death, right? Uh, however, you know, uh, a brain doesn't degenerate that fast just in a couple of weeks, all right? So this was, been... yes, this was long term massive damage and to the brain. Of your soul, no, no, from the original, from the anoxia oh, to the brain. The of oxygen to the brain. So in other words, that, that original anoxia that happened in her 20s, all right, caused massive brain damage, but it left the brainstem intact. <laughs> I, I was just uncertain because uh, the report shows you the one PBS. Yeah. 
yes, that she was a she was in persistent vegetative state. All right. So for not not confused. Yes, yes, exactly. But uh, the assumption here is that the massive brain damage was when she collapsed originally in her 20s, all right? Uh, that in other words, that brain remained without oxygen for so long, probably several hours, that there was no hope of recovery, uh, but the brain stem was still alive. Otherwise, she wouldn't have a pulse, okay? So, how do you see it? What do you think? No, I, I, I would I would back off of that comment and just we don't know her wishes. Yeah. Right. So we don't know her wishes. She did not have a DNR. She did not have a advanced directives or living will, and that's why I'm saying. And she was in her twenties. All right. That's why I'm saying it's never too early to do a living will, or to at least have the conversation, as I say, have the conversation with your parents, with your loved ones, so that they know where you stand, okay? Very important because uh, otherwise we get into the situation and it may well be that they had, that Terry and Michael had that conversation, all right? But there were no witnesses. Back then in the 90s, it was still just all this issue of, of euthanasia and so forth was uh, coming to light. So mm, there was nothing signed. Now, I find it unfortunate that Michael began this relationship, right, uh, prematurely because he was still married to Terry. Exactly. So if he was dishonest in that way, right, after all. Yeah. Would have preserved that money for some kind of medical purpose or something. Right, exactly. And so that would, that would then make it feel like, okay, now he's living more believable. There's no selfish incentive. Right, exactly. If he were to okay, forego so the inheritance, okay. right. If he were to forego the inheritance, right, yeah. or donate it to other people who are in similar condition or something like that, that could have been something very generous. He was not obligated to do that, but that would have kind of restored some of the credibility. Very true. But here's where we have to uh, cut between joint and marrow, as they say, with these uh, bioethical issues. The fact that a person may be uh, having some immoral behavior in some aspect of his life does not necessarily mean that another aspect of his life is also unethical, right? He can still be saying the truth about Terry, even though he has this uh, sexual weakness that he couldn't uh, wait until Terry was dead. Because once Terry was dead, he could have just simply married uh, Jody with no problem. But psychologically, I guess he moved on from Terry. But for, at least objectively, that moving on from Terry was uh, premature because after all, this was a Catholic couple married in the church. Catholic Church, and as those vows say, until death do us part, you know, in good times and in bad, well, here's the bad time, in sickness and in health, here's the sickness, okay, so you don't walk away on your spouse in the bad times, that's when uh, she needs you the most. However, in spite of all that, it could be that Michael was still stating the truth about Terry, Terry's wishes. Plus, let's make it personal. If any of us were in that state, at least if I were in that state, I wouldn't want to leave that brain. Exactly, exactly, right? I mean, it's pretty. You're not even going to be aware. Exactly. If there is really, the, if the prognosis is abysmal, in other words, if there's no hope of recovery, they had done EEGs and everything, it was just flatlined for the, for the, uh, for say, the cortex. I would say Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and it could be a bit of both too. Maybe he, I mean, again, I, I don't want to get into this accusation, but maybe he did have selfish intent as far as it was. And she nonetheless did express those wishes. I guess. Right, that's true too. So, it was kind of convenient, right? It was convenient that she expressed those wishes, but uh, 
I, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, it's a very credible story, what he's presenting. For my part, I wouldn't want to live that way for sure. Okay. So, but this was very wrenching at the time. And this is also, so there's always a silver lining because it happened in Florida and because it involved the legislature and the, the three branches of government, the executive had to keep people away, the police, the guards and everything. And the judiciary was certainly involved in this too. Then I'm just hoping that uh, physician assisted suicide is uh, not going to take hold in Florida for some time because if you think about it, the case of Terry Chavo is still in the back of the mind, it's still kind of fresh in the back of the mind of people who are at least in their 50s or 60s. We remember this case very well, all right? Uh, it, because it went on for so long, it was all over the place in the news. And therefore, any legislator today in Florida who would try to sponsor a bill for legalizing PAS may be, pardon the pun, but maybe political suicide, <laughs> precisely because this was so impalatable, this was so wrenching for the people of Florida at the time that anyone who would be espousing or, or um, what's the term, sponsoring a bill in the Florida legislature to legalize PAS, physician assisted suicide, is uh, not gonna be seen uh, well. You know, it's not gonna be well received. Certainly for if it, uh, my intuition, maybe I'm wrong, but my intuition, if, if it goes on the ballot as a popular ballot, right? Uh, you know, when we vote, uh, I think it wouldn't pass. It wouldn't pass yet, but What's the challenge and what's the, and what's the danger? As the years go on and on, Terry's case goes further and further into the background, into history, and fewer and fewer people remember her case because more of us are gonna be dying. <laughs> and therefore, the younger generation may not know about Terry's case, okay? And that's why I uh, use it as an example in class, to become familiar with it for several reasons. First, of course, to emphasize the issue about the advanced directives, take them seriously and so forth, but also how sometimes we have to cut between joint and marrow and see a, a procedure protocol that started as- I could be a kicker just for my flexibility. Oh yeah, she's definitely reading a book. I was reading the first. Oh, guys, reading your book on her phone. Microphone is on. Okay. Yeah, I can I had to switch. I had to switch. Okay, okay. We heard all your conversation. <laughs> uh, right. So a procedure that starts as ordinary means of life support on in time may become extraordinary. Okay and how to navigate that transition, delicate, but we have to do the burden ben benefit analysis and clinicians weigh in, but also ethicists and so forth. And I'm saying this because also part of this course is to make you experts in the field so that you may be able to help others uh, talk about these things and help them decide, well, nutrition and hydration, have, have they become extraordinary now? And maybe we allow the patient to die in peace, not killing the patient, but allowing the patient to die. And then it was that, that comfort care kicks in, including especially the analgesics, right? To the painkillers, in case she's feeling any pain, give her the painkillers in case she's feeling any pain. Okay. Questions, comments, the virtual people? No? People still there? No, we're good. Okay. Yeah, we're set okay, very good. Well, then. Okay. Sorry to start your weekend with this, but uh, this is it, folks. <laughs> oh, by the way, speaking of the weekend, also, um, I don't know if I mentioned, so it's uh, the, the, the deadline for the summaries is uh, 12, right? But um, 
the Monday lecture is due Wednesday midnight, but I think I have said that the Friday lecture is due Sunday mid uh, morning, or say, uh, in other words, uh, 12, uh, 12 noon, 12 noon, or did I say 12 midnight? Yeah. It was noon, yeah. Why? Because otherwise I don't have enough time to correct them <laughs> for Monday, all right? So in order to get them back to you by Monday at 12 noon, all right, not 12 midnight on Sunday, on Sunday. Hey, Actually, in the cinema, I haven't been in the drafts. So you just got mine today. I thought I, I thought I sent it like two days ago. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. You were talking to me? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, Derek. Go ahead, please. So I was saying I, I had left mine. Well, it didn't send. It was just sitting in a draft. I don't know why, because I... Cause when I just went um to get on the link, I said I had a draft waiting, and then I seen it. I so I just sent mine in from Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Yeah, I saw it come in. All right. No problem. So uh, this one, if you could uh, please have by twelve noon on Sunday. All right, and then I'll have it back to you for uh, Monday. Twelve noon or twelve midnight. Twelve noon. Twelve noon. Sunday. Twelve noon. Wednesday. Twelve midnight. Okay, so Sunday, 12 noon. In other words, do it today or do it tomorrow, but get it out of the way by tomorrow night. <laughs> okay, folks. Thanks again. We'll see you Monday, God willing. Have a good weekend, all right? Everybody, stay safe. Same, same. Thanks, Doc.